<laughs> wow, well, that was that was. So we're off and running, huh? Okay, well, let me strain my tie up and get going. Good morning, welcome to Guarantee RV. It's sometime in July of that year, 2020. Anyway, we're here to do an accessory uh, seminar. Uh, this is Dave Taylor. He is our service director. They call it fixed operations, right? Yeah. He's in charge of parts and service, so it's his fault. They call it fixed operations because everything that gets messed up, we fix. Yeah, there you go. Uh, my name is Dan. Uh, I've been here a while. We've been doing this for, I don't know, seven or eight years. Anyway, welcome and, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, the first part of our seminar is, again, about batteries. Uh, Dave has for years said that you don't have a good battery, you don't have a good camper because the batteries are a heart of your system. All of your controls, doesn't matter how fancy or basic your RV is, all of your system controls are 12 volt. So if you do dry camping, it's very important to have good 12 volt. The basic battery that comes with a new tent trailer is a 12 volt deep cycle battery. Deep cycle meaning is the plates are much fewer and they're much thicker like I am so that you can discharge the battery and then charge it back up over a long period of time. Conversely, a engine starting battery has a lot of very thin plates like that young lady and these thin plates have a high surface area so there's a lot of interaction between the sulfuric acid and water and the lead plate. The chemical reaction is sulfuric acid and lead goes to lead sulfate and an electron, thus starting your engine. Starter batteries are designed for a rapid just discharge over a short period of time. That means that if you try to use your start battery for a, a deep cycling battery, what's going to happen is that the plates are going to discharge and then they take all the lead off the plate and a lot of times all there is left is cardboard and you can't replate the lead to the cardboard so the batteries will not recharge. Don't use a starter battery for a deep cycle battery. There are several different kinds of batteries. The basics in, in your first tip trailer will be what we call a flooded cell or a wet cell. It's lead plate and, and sulfuric acid and water. When you get a little bit more sophisticated, you go to a six volt battery, which is the same footprint, but it's taller. And it is designed to deep cycle and it is a much better design. The, the six volt deep cycle batteries, obviously you need two of them, and it's a very simple connection. And the flooded cell deep cycle golf cart batteries last three to four years if they're well maintained. A 12 volt deep cycle will last three years or so. They don't last quite as long. After you've gone through a few sets of the flooded cell 6 volt batteries, and you say, you know, I'm tired of messing with the water all the time, you go to one of these. This is an absorbed glass mat AGM battery. This AGM battery is a sealed cell battery. You have a fiberglass pouch, the lead plates put in the pouch and impregnated with this gel. And this electrolyte gel is held right next to the battery. It does not outgas, it doesn't sweat. You don't add water. All you do is you clean the top off about once a year so that you don't get a current trail across the post. That's all you do for maintenance. And they will last six, eight years. All you do 
is keep charged up. They will tolerate a total discharge much better than a flooded cell battery. So if you forget, leave them for a couple months, and then they're just stone dead, they will recover better than a flooded cell battery. And they'll last twice as long. A six volt interstate battery, deep cycle golf cart, it's gonna be about 150 bucks. This ATM <coughs> lifeline is, no? No, I'm just, oh, I'm sorry, here in the throat. This AGM from Lifeline is 400 bucks. Won't quite last three times as long, but you don't have to maintain it. It's a much more durable battery. If you're doing a lot of dry camping and you have a big inverter and solar panels, this is the best battery out there. It's much more durable does a very good job. And then a, a Johnny Newcomer on the market is the lithium ion battery. And oh, yeah. we were, Dave and I were just starting to play with them last year when this COVID thing hit. And this kind of went away. But hopefully when this is all over, we start playing with them again. The best one out there is Battleborn that I can see. Uh, that these are, they're not a battery like you and I would think of a battery with lead and acid. They're capacitors and a printed circuit board. All these capacitors are controlled by the printed circuit board. So as you desire or demand current, the printed circuit board discharges a capacitor. And one of the very interesting things about these uh, lithium ion batteries is if you have a meter and, and as you're using this battery, you notice that the potential of this battery stays at about 11.6. It might dip to 11.3. It all depends on the processor in that printed circuit board. After days of use, all of a sudden that 12.3, 12.6, boom, drops off to zero. Battery's dead like my little cordless. I have a lithium ion cordless. And that thing just goes and goes and then it's done. Put another battery in it, go and go and go. They hold the same charge throughout their duration. We have ex experimented with these and it's interesting. We do a lot of high-end stuff where they'll have four to six of the big panels and 8 to 12 deep cycle batteries. And we, we had the, the solar panels, and they, they, we've had a few where we've converted, we've taken the AGMs out, and we've put in the lithium ion. And this one guy, he insisted he only wanted four instead of 12 of the lithium ion. And once we did it, we were testing it, and we just happened to have another coach with the same AGM solar panel configuration. And the lithium ion, instead of 12 batteries, there was only four. And they did almost as good as those 12 AGM batteries, because they used their power much more efficiently, and the power stays at the same level throughout their input, output, where this one will roll off and you'll start out with a, each cell has 2.1 volts, so you'll have 12.6 volts, chemically, naturally, is a full battery. And it might dribble down, this one will dribble down maybe to 12, 11, 6, and that's about the end of it, right? That's it. 11, it's 6, 11, 4 is a dead battery. Yes. Yep. And, and then they roll off and the appliances just don't work. These stay at 12, 6, 12, 3. They just stay the same. Much more efficient. And when these get low, you're really, your power is really weak need. When these are low, 
they're just as good as when they're fully charged. There's no maintenance. We have no clue how long they, uh, they last. Uh, the interesting thing is, like on the battle board, you can take the cover off and you can replace each little module of printed circuit or of diodes. If you have one of the little modules bad, you can either send the battery in or they send you the part and you can replace it. Now you have a brand new battery. Just because you have a couple of bad diodes, you don't throw it away, you repair that piece and away you go. The bad news is, well, a year and a half ago or so, we were selling for 15, 1600 bucks a piece. Just when COVID hit, we were, Dave and I were working with Battleborn to become a dealer. And at that point, they were retailing at 995, which a year earlier, they had been at almost 2000. I don't know what they are now, but they're coming down. And I'm sure that at some point they will be competitive with these because they ostensibly can last for a very long period of time. And they're very stable power. This weighs about 35 pounds. Not really that big a deal. This is 80, 84 pounds. The weight is insignificant, but it's still it's a feature. There's nothing you do to it. They don't sweat. They don't have any lead. They don't have any acid. You can put them anywhere. They do a great job. They're very interesting. Very interesting guys. One of the things, though, that makes this a little bit more expensive is lithium-ion batteries are pulse charged. In other words, they send the, the charger sends a, a big pulse of current and then shuts down. And that can play kind of a havoc on an alternator because you have a big amount of current being put out from the alternator and then nothing. And that's kind of hard on the charge controller in the alternator. So you have to install a special charge controller control that so you don't destroy your alternator. They're about 300 bucks. All of the new coaches last couple of years uh, with the smart converters, they are all set up for, for the most part, except for a couple of the real cheap ones, they're all set up for lithium ion. They are all capable of lithium ion when you plug into 110 or you run your generator. Zamp Solar, which is one on my list, uh, I, I love solar, and Zamp, uh, Jim Bozamp started the company after a few years, he brought, he invested millions and brought the, the manufacturing back to Bend, Oregon, and all of his solar panels now are built in Bend, Oregon, which is, I'm very proud of. The, all of his charge controllers are designed to handle lithium ion batteries. They have the circuitry in their charge controllers to handle that. So it's, it's, it's something that we have be able to handle if somebody has way more money than I do. I mean, way more money. Uh, speaking of solar panels, these are 12-volt battery chargers. They put out pure DC, and it's interesting. When I was in grade school, we had a science teacher, and I, I'll never forget, he had, looked like a butter knife, but it was a bimetallic strip. And he would heat it, and that strip would bend. And the reason it would bend is the steel on one side would expand at a different rate than the copper on the other side. So with it being expanded long, it's longer, and to compensate, it would bend. It put up a molecular resistance between the two. And if you 
had a micro voltmeter, you could read a very small difference in voltage between the copper and the steel. Kind of the same theory here. And it's all put on a silica wafer, and you have exotic metals, rare earth metals, laminated together in a grid so that when they're hit by radiation, radiation is microwave, radio wave, TV, visible light, infrared, heat, that's all waves. And when they hit this, they stimulate that, and the, 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 the cell puts off a small amount of electricity because it has a very similar situation going on between these rare earth metals. Originally, they were only doing it with green light. There are three primary colors, red, blue, and green. Red is heat. Can't do it with heat. Uh, the red won't work. And they were doing it green because that was easiest. And then a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, they started doing it with blue light in combination. So they almost doubled the efficiency of solar panels because now they're using two of the three primary wave patterns to generate current. So that's why we started seeing more and more output. 15, 20 years ago, action was longer. It was in the mid-90s. Argo put out the uh, 48, and it was a panel this wide and this long, put out 48 watts. This is 80. So a little bit more efficient. That was in the mid-90s. The new stuff, this big, 170 watts. 170 watts. Really efficient. It's about 19 volts. So you need a charge controller to drop it down so it doesn't destroy the batteries. It does not make one pin. It just makes good battery charge if you're dry camping. If you're dry camping and you don't want to listen to the generator and you want to watch TV, you want to run the microwave, you need a big inverter. And solar panel batteries, inverter packs, I, I tell people all the time it's a very personal thing because everybody has a different coach, everybody has a different lifestyle. If you come to the point where you want to do an inverter or you want to do solar, you need to find somebody that knows what they're talking about and just talk to them about how you want to do things. And then they'll design a system for you. As long as they're not greedy, you should come out okay. But good systems, and they're all designed to work together. They all have their own specific ability. I think I'm almost down to... Um, except for most of it, we just kept going. So we'll just switch all over the place. Well, I want to talk about, well, I'm still at the electrical, I want to talk about uh, usually he talks about bi-directional relays, but kind of ties in this time. He's going to talk about poop here in just a few minutes. Yeah. So uh, he has it on the contract, and he gets to talk about poop. So I can't <laughs> not let him do it. So all we're talking about is the 12 volt electrical system. There's two different systems in, in your RV. One, when you start your engine, the alternator is designed to, after the chassis battery comes up, I remember in the 80s that Intellitech had this magic program that you started your old Ford, that, v, that, that 460 would rumble along, and all of a sudden the voltage would drop because the chassis battery was pretty well charged up, and it would switch over to charge the coach side battery, I mean, we were living. I mean, this that was that was new world stuff. Well, the problem is when you're plugged in for a long period of time, the chassis battery gets neglected. 
So, 20 years after that, somebody came up with a bright idea of a bi-directional relay device, a bird. And what the bird does is the exact same thing, but it does it backwards. You're plugged into 110, house batteries, are they're living, they're doing fine. The chassis batteries, he's dying. Because the oven had started getting in two months, life's tough. So on the, on the bird, it samples the coach batteries, and when they're fine, it, it ties in the chassis battery, tops it up. So now if you go south for the winter, you don't have to worry about your chassis battery being dead. You don't have to worry if you have ADMs or whatever. You don't have to worry about maintenance and adding water. All you have to do is keep the, the water level correct in your gym. You sit there and you enjoy the sunshine. You don't have to worry about the rest of the stuff. Bi-directional relay devices. Newmark has been doing them since 15 or 16. And nobody else has really hardly picked up on it, but we do a lot of them after work. Uh, they do a very good job. The bi-directional relay device is about two, 250. And depending on what your coach is, how it's wired, a couple hundred in labor, they, they do a, a, a very good job. Yes, they do. Um, you want to jump in on your stuff now while I try to catch up with me, right? Yeah. Okay. Have I'm going to let Dave talk for a while. Well, i got to get up out of his chair now. Pull the pants up. Okay, we're going to talk about my favorite thing, which is black and gray tanks. Uh, hopefully everybody knows what happens in a black and gray tank. Both of them are not gray. A lot of people uh, assume that a gray tank should shower water, hand wash and water, and it's clean. It's really not. A lot, of, a lot of waste goes down the gray tank, off your dinner plates, your body, your hair. Uh, and, and gray tanks actually can get more grease in them than a black tank. So when I started here a long time ago, I was introduced to this Happy Camper. Ha happy Camper. It's made right here in Oregon. And I thought, what is that? We've always used the same old green blue dye that we stuck down the toilet. So I got introduced to this, and it took me about a month to realize it was the best thing on the market. And they don't pay me to say that or send me a pizza or nothing. What I can tell you is it doesn't have a smell. So what you're not doing is covering up the sewer smell. You put this in, it actually eliminates the smell. So you'll find that our technicians will use this quite a bit when they have to work on a black or a gray tank. They'll mix this up and put it in there and let it sit for a couple hours and then dump it. And it, when you don't have to smell it, it makes it a whole lot easier to work with. When you're going to put this in your tanks, you're going to take a couple gallon bucket, five gallon bucket, put your scoop or two in it. It is a powder, so it's a granulate, and it takes a little bit to dissolve. So you stir it, then pour it down in your tank. If you do that every time you dump your tank, I can almost guarantee you won't have a probe cleaning issue. You're going to know when that happens when you dump your tank and it still shows you're half full. What happens, this is my favorite part, this is the part I get to talk about. You didn't give me a pin this time. I did? No, I got, I'm going to have to use one of your old ones. I'm sorry. Let's see if I can find it. There's a water heater. There's a black tank. I was not great in art class, I apologize. You have a black tank right here that runs off, you have probes in the side. Most have probes that go in the inside. Some of the newer ones have stick on probes that stick on the side. They still reap resistance. So what they're reading with a stick on is open air. As soon as water gets to it, or something gets to that side of the tank, it shows that something's in the way, so it turns a little red light on on your monitor panel. With probes, they actually stick inside the tank. They look, they look like a pencil, or a pencil eraser. They're about half inch long. 
what happens is you get these little dudes floating around in here. And at some point, this one thing's going to wander over here and stick itself right to that. So what you've done is harpoon the turd right on that little probe. When you dump the tank, that little thing just hangs there. Or a little piece of toilet paper or anything. Your tank can be empty. It'll still show that it's half or three quarters full. This, instantly, when you put this down in your tank and you start using it and adding waste to it, starts to turn what's in there just to a mush, to a milkshake. It's not a great thing to visualize, but... So this heats up all the waste, keeps it liquid so that when you dump your tank, it all comes out. You are, it is good to, at least a couple times a year, refill your tank with fresh water, put some of this in it, and just reflush your tank. And if you're like me, I like to wash my tank a couple times a year until there's nothing but clear water coming out. I buy an in-line little window so I can see what's coming out. There's reasons for these. It's not for the faint of heart the first couple of times, but when you, when you can get your tanks so they're running clear, your monitor panel is always going to read it. Good with that? Yeah. I'm going to go to LED, LED bulbs, another one of my things. They're great to a point. LED bulbs are, if you dry camp a lot, a great thing to have. They really cut down on your voltage juice, save your battery life. Uh, there is, I kind of got into these right when they started coming out and I ran down here and bought 500 bucks worth because you know they were about 70 bucks a piece then. Bought a whole bunch for my fifth wheel, plugged them in and it was so bright you couldn't stand to be in it. So there are different colors of these. You don't want to put bright white and everything in your RV, or it'll be so bright it never tries. Um, but like I say, as far as if you're a dry camper, great. They use the cool white, soft whites, uh, especially if it's over your reading chair or something like that. So they're, they're about 20 times as efficient. Oh yeah. They're, they're much more efficient. I'm even changing my car. I'm putting, I have a, an older Chevy Impala. And I'm going to put LEDs in all the tail lights. And matter of fact, that I'm supposed to go pick those up today at some point. Okay. So, you have, anybody have questions about gray tanks or black tanks? Uh, well, I'm going to, you know what? Max air max air covers. It's good to put over your vents on your fifth wheel or motorhome so you can leave the vents up while it's raining. You can leave it up when you're driving. In Oregon, we have a lot of days that are 70 degrees and we still have some rain. So it's nice to be able to leave that vent open and get a little fresh air into your rig. You tell them about that little red thing, I'll take over and you can... Oh. Okay. This is one of Dave's favorites. It is, because I actually have one of the original ones that's aluminum. Back when we could still get aluminum. i got to take a breath. This thing's hot. So while you're taking a breath, I'm gonna, you know what we should do? We should call Governor Brown, have her come down here with a fan and give us some air. So while he's catching up... I'm is, good now. I just had to... Okay. Okay. Yeah, I had the same problem. If you have a towable, this is the best thing you'll ever carry to change a tire. I'd love to say you're never going to have a flat tire, but you're going to. And it's never going to be in a great spot. It's like your car, it never breaks down in the driveway, it's always a safe one. So, the best thing about one of these is if you have a towable, you have two tires on that side. The tire that's not flat, you put this right in front of her or behind it. You use your truck to back up or pull forward on it. It takes your good tire, runs it up here, and this starts to tip like that. And your good tire actually lifts your flat tire off the ground. So all you have to do then is change your tire, drive off this, both tires come down on the ground, and drive away. It's better than any bottle jack you'll ever have for changing a tire on a tow wheel. And you can go online and look these up. 
they have tough chocks. There's different names for them. This is a rapid jack. And again, we don't get paid to preach about any of this. It's just years of experience. Between the two of us, we've been doing this 75 years. Long time. And I've only been doing it five years. So. 41 for me. 41 for you and 33 for me. At 74, where I went to high school. Yeah. They taught math back then, I think. Yeah, they still did, yes. And believe it or not, we taught America. Okay, sewer hoses. I let that slip. Sewer hoses. Different versions, different sizes, different varieties. We don't, Dan and I don't care which one you buy. But it's kind of like a good pair of shoes. Last thing you want to do if you're a marathon runner is buy five dollar pair of shoes. Buy good sewer hoses. The last thing you want, yeah, it's not a musical instrument. The last thing you want to do is fill your five dollar shoes with sewage because you bought the nine dollar one from your local hardware store. Pay the money, get a good one. It's money well spent. Slide toppers. I'm sorry we're breezing through this so fast. With coronavirus in Oregon, we're having to wear these things every second here, and they get a little warm up here. So you're getting kind of the abbreviated version of our accessory seminar. When this is over, please come back, and you'll see the whole boring two hours of Dan and I up here with our, our shtick. Kind of like Laurel and Hardy when we get going. <laughs> For those of us old enough to remember Laurel and Hardy. Slide toppers. Uh, a lot of people come in and they say, hey, I have a water leak in my slide room, so put a slide topper over it to stop that slide, that leak. That's not what a slide topper's for. It can assist in keeping water off the top of your coach or off your slide room, but it's actually for the sun and squirrel poop, bird poop, pine cones. You would not believe what we find on top of slide rooms. Uh, hundreds of different objects, frisbees, softballs, tennis balls, you name it, we find it. That's going to help keep them off there, keep the life for your slide room uh, roof, uh, make it a lot, live a lot longer. Am I, am I going too fast for you? You're doing just fine. Okay, if you got questions, stop us. Slide trays, not as big as they were 30 years ago. There used to be Oh, what were the names of the big black slide trays that would go in the bays? Well, anyway, slide trays. If you have Joey a big bed. motor, huh? Joey bed? Joey beds. I'm going to put you to work at service. <laughs> they have these big beds you built. If you had a big motor home or a fifth wheel with a big pass-through front bay, they were these big cumbersome roll-out. Joey beds, they called them, that would roll clear out either side, and you can stack your pop in them, and they're great. They've come a long way. Now they're aluminum, not as quite high sided. However, they do take a lot of your room up. Because in order to make that Joey bed run in and out, we have to bring it to the inside of the door frame, and it has to sit back from the door frame. So if you're not somebody that has a ton, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> ton of stuff in your bays of your motorhome or fifth wheel. Probably work out great for you. If you have stuff stacked to the ceiling front to rear, this is just going to reduce the amount of space you have in your fifth wheel or motorhome. You already went over solar panels. Yeah. Stabilizers. You know, it's, this is still on here, and a lot of it's because some of a lot of the people come to this buy used units that are 8, 10, 15 years old. There's nothing wrong with them. Some people keep their stuff in really good shape, and there's nothing better than a 20-year-old Nash that Grandpa had because they built a good trailer. However, back then they didn't put stabilizers on everything. So they had these crank-up hand aluminum jacks you had to put under each corner. You remember those days, don't you? Oh, yeah. Now you can find them at garage sales for about a nickel apiece. Now they come up with stabilizers that actually mount to the frame where you just crank them down by hand or with the drill. They work great. They are a stabilizer, not a jack. I see them in the campgrounds all the time where the guy's got it clear up on 
tires clear up off the ground off stabilizer. And then they run inside, a couple of kids jump around and the stabilizers fold up. And then they're in here wondering what happened. Therefore, when you get level, you just stabilize the trailer, the fifth wheel, whatever you have. Going. We still sell them. Most manufacturers anymore, I don't think, I can't think of any that don't put them on from the factory. Now, if you don't like doing the manual one or putting your drill out there to do it, they do have upgraded systems that are electric. So all you have to do is push the button. We put quite a few, even those are starting to become less popular with install just because a lot of the higher line towable companies are already putting those on the units. But we do have them. Your local dealer should have them. If they don't, they can get them and probably love to install them. Am I going too fast? No, you're done. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm done. I was told. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. So, when, when we do these seminars, we're trying to expose people to some of the neat things that they need to learn about that will help them in their RV experience. Trying to get a couple things out of the way. Uh, there's a couple different water filter systems out there, different kinds. Uh, this one is this canister type. It has a filter in it about the size of this. And you can get different grades of filter. You can leave it outside, put this down, it's got sharp ends on it, or you can get this mounted inside your wet bay. That is basically filtering all the water coming into your coach. If you go south where it seems like the further south you go, the harder the water is, the more that you want something like this to filter everything, get the big chunks out. This one has a little flexible hose and a little cartridge, and this is, does the same thing. When this cartridge is, is done, you throw it away and you put another one on there. It goes hose bib, hose, filter, main hose in. These are not expensive. These little filters that go in here and here, they're about 10 bucks to 20 bucks, depending on what you want to filter out. There's, it's just not feasible to put a micro filter in here because if they clog up almost immediately, you're trying to do your whole RV. If you want to filter almost everything out, then we put one of these smaller filters like under the kitchen sink for the cold water. And that will take out, we have some that will take out all sorts of bacteria and, and, and minerals and things like that. People want to know how long they last. The manufacturer says once they start to slow down, get rid of them. If you winterize in the fall, take it out. In the spring, go buy a new one, put it in, throw the old one away. You need to replace it at least once a year. You don't want them to sit in there because that bacteria and everything that you filtered out sit in there and just living it up. So you need to get rid of it. One thing I do want to talk about in some detail, around the year 2000, we thought we were really living. We had domes, we had direct TV, we had dish network, and we could take that out on the road. And we could watch TV going down the highway. But then as things got more complicated, the domes didn't do a very good job, so they came up with open face TVs. And when the traveler hit, man, we thought we were living again. But unfortunately, Some government came up with the idea that we can control people's thought process through TV. And so a lot of people watching DirecTV and Dish Network, they cut the cord.
because they didn't want all that propaganda. What they did is they, they got this little thing called a Roku, and then they could put Roku, they could put internet on their television. And, and now you could watch just about anything you wanted, but you were in control. If you didn't like their attitude, you'd go watch something else. And, and you could still see Smithsonian History Channel. You could watch Fox News if you wanted. You could even watch CNN if you really had issues. But you needed some way of getting a signal for your cell phone, for your Wi-Fi, into your RV. And I remember around 210, I was working with a friend of mine that was in the Navy, and he was really smart on this stuff. And he made something up, and another friend of mine took it down to, uh, they were in Nevada, uh, Utah, and they were shooting off rockets. And he thought this was really neat because they were out in the middle of nowhere, and he had four bars. Well, somewhere in the industry, somebody picked up on this, and then, unfortunately, the government said, all you truck drivers have to have, you have to check in, you have to do this, you have to log this, and it has to be on the internet. And so, truckers started needing Wi-Fi to do their job. And one of the companies that picked up on this and really has done a good job is WeBoost. And I got this into our company because this has been such a, a very good problem. We used to do the WeBoost trucker and then WeBoost figured out that there was a whole lot of RVers out there with slightly different needs. And so they came up with a, a RV specific. We don't have those big mirrors, big chrome tube mirrors, so we can't ha hang a whip and pin on them. We have to have a roof mount. And we want to be able to go down the road. Mama wants to email the grandkids, and then you got to do the banking. It's got to be secure, got to be fast. That's what this is. This new stuff is absolutely amazing. Uh, it's very popular. What it does is there's an antenna on the roof. It pulls in. This is my antenna, my receiver, and my amplifier, and my processor. This antenna for receiving and transmitting is like three times as big as my phone. And that's all it does. So this receives and accepts signal. It goes to a router, processes it, goes to an inside antenna, and the first time you hook it up, you make your cell phone to it. It downloads the information off your SIM card. And when you do your tablet, then you do your laptop. And as long as you're within 10 to 20 feet of this, in remote areas where you would normally have maybe one bar, as long as you're within about 10 feet, you'll have four to five bars. Because you have a much larger receiver, you have a better processor, and then it communicates directly and it learns your, your personal signal. It's just that number that's on the bottom corner of your computer. Anyway, it learns that. So only you're accessible to that Wi-Fi hotspot that this creates. And it is, this is a data processor. It is designed to be able to process any kind of signal that you need for your laptop. So you could be out 100 miles from a cell tower and still be able to stick your head up. It may be bad, but 
at least you can do it. If you're along the corridor in a dark spot, you can still do high speed, you can still do your banking. Nobody can piggyback you. It's secure and it's encrypted. We have huge luck with this. And I know this is political, but Americans are really waking up. And there's a lot of information on the internet to help you open your eyes, deal with your family, do your banking. And this kind of thing right here is what helps people while they're on the road. One guard who makes the Traveler, which is an exceptional satellite dish, they also make a couple different Wi-Fi extenders. It's a different approach. It does a pretty good job. This one, instead of using your SIM card, your, what you're already paying for, you either have to buy monthly access or you have to take the SIM card out of your phone and put it in there. This one, all it needs to do is know who you are. This one, not quite as strong. They're both rated and controlled by the FCC, but this does a much better job. But for the vanilla people, this is good enough. And it does a pretty good job. We also have um, there's the one that's the 4G, which is the better of the two. This is the more basic. This one, you cannot do this. But the 4G model is the one that you could do internet. This is just an extender. And in a lot of the parks, this will pick up the signal from, like our park out here, we, we have public Wi-Fi. It'll pick that up and amplify it so that it's something usable. But you're restrained by the size of our system. And if there's all 47 people in there, plugged in, turned on, you're not gonna have a lot of bandwidth for what you wanna do. This kind of a system, you can be in our park, and it just doesn't care. Because it's doing this job directly. And it does a very good job. You can get different versions. This, is, this one will handle four items as long as they're on the same program. And it's stationary or in motion. And then they have ones that are stationary only, but they can handle a whole lot more gap. So it's just all what you want. But this is an alternative. This is the next step beyond direct TV and dish network. And I don't know if I mentioned this. Uh, this is about a thousand dollars, nine fifty to a thousand to install. And what's the monthly fee on Roku? It's free. You don't have to pay for it. And it's uh, it's a huge new world out there. Very interesting. Thousand dollars. That's like a day's pay, isn't it? For my boss, it is. Yeah, no. Well, I wish. No, so much for that. Uh, we'll move on slightly. I think that's time. about the last thing we're going to go over. Yeah. I want to talk about these. Back in the beginning, Dave and I used to argue about this all the time. I never saw the need for one until he said, "Well." What if you're on a three-week vacation, you've been planning on it for two years, and you get halfway across the country, you get to Pennsylvania, and you're just loving that lightning storm, and all of a sudden, all your power goes out. Lightning hit, ran through your coach, fried everything in. If you have one of these, you can get it replaced. If it's under the first gear, you send it in in the box, they send you another one back. If you're after the first year, you go buy a new one for 350 bucks, and you get on with your three-week vacation. If you're like me, you're in Pennsylvania, your TV's fried, your microwave's fried, your air conditioner's fried, your converter's fried, your inverter's fried, you're screwed. Now you've got to find a place to fix it. 
rent a car while they fix it, go do your vacation, go home, fly back a month later, and haul this motorhome back home that got fried by lightning. So having said that, I finally, two or three years in, I kind of gave up and gave in. He was right. He didn't fire me over, but uh, nope. I finally got it. They, they, we, they do a good well, job. We only see two or three coaches come in a year that have been fried. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty devastating. Yeah. And again, it's never the guy had it fried down the street in his driveway. It's the people from Canada or wherever. And they still have two weeks left of their trip. And i got to let them know that I won't even be able to look at it for a week. And I won't be able to get parts for four weeks. So most of the time, they go down here to the airport and fly home. And then that's how their trip turned out. So anyway, this is, this is like a big piece. It's designed to flow. But the, the reason these are so expensive is, let's say that some guy hits a telephone pole because he's had too much to drink, and uh, 10,000 volts jumps the transformer and runs up the line. So instead of being plugged into a 30 amp service, you're plugged into a 500 amp, 10,000 volt service. And in the nanoseconds that it takes to fry the fuse in here, a good one will absorb that current and not let it pass. And they're rated in joules. And this one's a pretty good one. This one's uh, 6,200 joules, so that's about as high as you could get, and that's why I picked this one. It's a good product. The lower the amount of joules, the less current this can hold, and the cheap ones, we sell some cheap ones, like for 10 trailers and that, I guess. Those, the joules are maybe 2,000. So let's say you're using one of the cheap ones, because that's how you are and you get hit with this 10,000 volts. As it's, that 10,000 volts hits, in the nanoseconds this melts, half of it's gone through. So the microwave is toast, the air conditioner is toast, the converter is toast, but the TV works. Okay, that's the whole difference. So if, if you're going to the east, where there's so much lightning. I lived in Denver for two years. They have lightning. If you go somewhere where there's a lot of lightning, this is definitely a good thing. So, if you buy one, look at the jewels, buy the biggest one you get. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. I think we're about done here. Yeah. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Thank you all for coming. We're going to do this again someday. Next month we'll do the uh, RV. You know, can't call it the 101 anymore. Somebody else called it that. And we got August uh, RV Basics. RV Basics next month. Yeah, that, yeah, if this is still going on, it's going to be a very basic RV Basics. Yes, it will. So, everybody stay safe. Thank you very much, David. Thanks for sitting here and listening to us drone on.